Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Michelle Hawkes. I'm the director of the Liu Institute for Asia and Asian Studies here at the University of Notre Dame's Keogh School of Global Affairs. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to the Liu Institute's third Justice in Asia Distinguished Lecture. And uh, And the first one to be held in person. The annual, this annual event invites top scholars to examine justice in connection to Asia across disciplinary and regional boundaries and definitions. This year, the Liu Institute is honored to have two outstanding co-sponsors, the Department of Philosophy in the College of Arts and Letters and the Ansari Institute for Global Engagement with the Religion, which is a sister institute here at the Keogh School. Our moderator today is Professor Mike Zhao, who's an assistant professor of philosophy at Notre Dame and a faculty fellow of the Liu Institute. Professor Zhao works mainly in ethics with interests in ancient Chinese philosophy, social and political philosophy, and formal philosophy. He received a PhD from New York University and joined Notre Dame in 2020. It's my great pleasure to now hand over to Professor Zhao, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Michelle, for that introduction. It is my privilege and pleasure to introduce uh, this year's Distinguished Justice in Asia lecturer, Jay Garfield. Professor Garfield is coming to us from Smith College, where he currently holds the titles of Doris Silbert Professor in the Humanities and Professor of Philosophy, Logic, and Buddhist Studies, and where he directs the, Buddhist, uh, the Tibetan Studies in India program. He is widely regarded as a leading figure in the field of Buddhist philosophy, but his research is unabashedly eclectic, extending beyond Buddhist philosophy to uh, the foundations of cognitive science, philosophy of mind, metaphysics, moral psychology, logic, and I think I could name 10 other fields that Professor Garfield has worked in. He's the author of over 100 publications in both academic and public facing outlets, as well as over 30 books. His most recent book, uh, Losing Ourselves, How to Live Without a Self, argues for the Buddhist idea that the sense of self is an illusion, one that we should learn to live without. So without further ado, Professor Garfield. Thank you very much, Michael, for far too generous an introduction. And thank you to the Lu Center, to the Lu family. Uh, to the philosophy department uh, for, for having me here. It's really an enormous honor to be at Notre Dame. And, uh, you know, to be giving a, a, a talk like this is a, is a great honor. Thank you so much. Um, so what I'll be talking about today is Buddhism and nonviolence in the contemporary world. It's a slightly hortatory lecture, a more public-facing lecture. And um, I hope you enjoy it. Um, let me ask a quick question. How many people here are fans of the Indigo Girls? The Indigo Girls. Okay, I've got a couple people here. Yeah. See, I think that you can do almost all of philosophy through rock and roll lyrics. And uh, I think you can do almost all of Buddhist philosophy through Indigo Girls lyrics. Um, so I'm going to frame this talk with some Indigo Girls lyrics um, from uh, Let It Be Me, which is for those of you who care about discography from um, that first great album. Anyway. Um, the poem goes, uh, let it be me, this is not a fighting song. Let it be me, not a wrong for a wrong. Let it be me, if the world is night, shine my life like a light. We're going to kind of start there. So, and also thank you for coming in on a gorgeous day when you really should be outside. <laughs> I'll try to make it worth your while. Um, so this essay, as I said, is not a disinterested analysis of Buddhist doctrine. I do that other places. It's an unapologetic exposition of the implications of that doctrine for ethics and political action in the contemporary world. Ethics is meant to be demanding. If you don't want your commitments and your life to be challenged, then you shouldn't think about ethical demands, and you shouldn't continue listening to this lecture. If you do want to know what a Buddhist ethical framework demands in the contemporary world, be prepared for difficult truths. To understand a Buddhist analysis of nonviolence in a way that's relevant to our contemporary life, it's first important to understand how violence manifests in the contemporary world 
Second, we've got to develop a recognizably Buddhist analysis of that violence and its causes. And third, we've got to examine how a Buddhist ethical framework determines our responsibilities as agents in the context of that violence and in the context of a path to its eradication. So it's kind of three-part stage, talk about um, violence in the contemporary world, talk about a Buddhist analysis, then talk about a Buddhist prescription. For the first task, I'm going to turn to the contemporary tradition of engaged Buddhism, and in particular to the thought of the late Thich Nhat Hanh, um, as expounded in his book, Interbeing, and His Holiness the Dalai Lama XIV in Ethics for the New Millennium. Their thought is in turn inflected by the thought of Mohandas Gandhi, which incorporates in turn both Jain and Hindu ideas, and by that of Bimral Ambedkar's fusion of Buddhist and Marxist ideas in the service of a politically active Buddhism. For the second task, that is the Buddhist analysis, I'm going to return to the source. That is the analysis of suffering and the causes of suffering presented in the discourse Turning the Wheel of Doctrine, that's the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta um, from the, the Pali Canon. For the third task, that is the prescription, we're going to draw on the Bodhisattva path as articulated by Shantideva in How to Lead an Awakened Life, that's Bodhicharya Avatara, and an understanding of Buddhist moral phenomenology in terms of the divine states or the Brahma Viharas. And that's an analysis suggested by Buddha Gosa's presentation in The Path of Purification. That's Visuddhi Maga. There will be a quiz. Um, <clears throat> Some might raise eyebrows at this very syncretic use of contemporary material, sutta material from the Pali Canon, classical Mahayana and Theravada commentarial sources stirred together in the same pot. But the universe of Buddhist ethical discourse is vast, and I prefer to draw inspiration from as much of it as possible to construct a non-sectarian Buddhist analysis of nonviolence that could be useful to all of us. My discussion will not be philological and exegetical, other times, other places. It's going to be philosophical, prescriptive, and polemical. Just as Peter Singer's emphasized, consequentialism demands more from us than what makes us morally comfortable. I'm going to argue that Buddhist ethics is more demanding than we might like it to be. So fasten your seatbelts. Um, so I'm going to begin by talking about the engaged Buddhist analysis of structural violence. When we use the term nonviolence in English, we usually take ourselves to be translating the Sanskrit term ahimsa. That's kind of the term that, got, that Gandhi had in mind as he was using the term. That's the term that Ambedkar had in mind when he was using the term. The term, as many have noted, is much more precisely translated as non-harm or non-injury, if we think about the meaning of ahimsa. The lexical point is important, and I'm not just being pedantic here. I'm going to use this point. Viol the word violence in English connotes a violation. Those words are, of course, cognate, which in turn connotes a deviation from the normal, from the expected or the required. So when we talk about violent action, we talk about action that deviates and violates norms. Himsa, deriving from a root that means to strike, does not have that resonance. It simply connotes injury to oneself or to another. The point's important. Because as we're going to see, much of what constitutes himsa or harm is often normal, expected, and even socially, legally required, despite its morally problematic status. And that's going to be part of the diagnosis of structural violence. An important contribution, I think, of the engaged Buddhist movement is the direction of our attention to the normalization of harm, or what we've come to call violence in everyday life and the need for radical change if we're going to lead individually or collectively lives of ahimsa or nonviolence or non-harm. So when I use the English term nonviolence, you hear that as ahimsa, that is as non-harm. In Hind Swaraj, um, Gandhi's wonderful, wonderful manifesto, Gandhi levels a devastating critique of modern civilization that informs much of engaged Buddhist thought. People forget this a lot, that contemporary engaged Buddhism draws a lot of its inspiration from a non-Buddhist thinker, that is from um, Mohandas Gandhi. And you can't really understand contemporary engaged Buddhism without doing that. Footnote, long footnote, 
there are people who are purists about things and think that, you know, it's only really Buddhism if it draws only on historically Buddhist sources, or if it was written before the first century CE, or if it came from the mouth of, or whatever. I have no, no truck with that at all. Buddhism is a living, evolving tradition that inflects and is inflected by every tradition with which it's interacted. And I, we can fight about that in question and answer if you want, but I'm not a purist about anything. I mean, if you're talking about a doctrine whose fundamental idea is that nothing has any essence, you can't start to get being essentialist about that doctrine. If you're talking about a doctrine that says that everything's impermanent, you can't say that doctrine has to have remained fixed for 2,600 years, okay? Um, Gandhi's analysis of modern civilization, modern civilization as essentially violent, is tightly connected to his own understanding of ahimsa as involving a withdrawal from that civilization into a simpler, more agrarian organization of human life. I'm just going to read to you a little bit from Hind Swaraj to give you a flavor for that. How many people here have read Hind Swaraj? Oh, gosh, the rest of you? Tonight, that's your homework. Pick up Hind Swaraj. It's far too important a book for any educated person in the 21st century not to have read. It's far too entertaining a book not to read. Um, okay, here's a little bit. Gandhi writes, this is all quotation, formally, men, and there's, there is an, a, there's a sexism here, it's an old book. Formerly, men worked in the open air only so much as they liked. Now thousands of workmen meet together and for the sake of maintenance work in factories and mines, dark satanic mills, you should think. Their condition is worse than that of beasts. They're obliged to work at the risk of their lives at most dangerous occupations for the sake of millionaires. Not much has changed. Formerly, men were made slaves under physical compulsion. Now they are enslaved by the temptation of money and the luxury that monies can buy. End of quotation. In his discussion, not only of the broad contours of European capitalist modernity, but also in his discussion of things like trains and machinery, which he regards as its concrete manifestation, Gandhi emphasizes that the violence engendered and the damage caused to human lives and social relations cannot be explained by individual actors, but rather is constituted by their actions in the context of an indefensible system. That is, it's a structural systemic analysis, not an analysis of individual agency. While these structures induce individual violence, and while Gandhi does argue that each individual has a responsibility to work to dismantle these violent structures and to refrain from individual violence, um, the structural violence that provides the context for that individual violence is the direct target of his analysis. That's why the book is interesting. Um, although Gandhi was not a Buddhist, his commitment to ahimsa inspired engaged Buddhists and his understanding of structural violence was deeply influential. Um, in fact, uh, the Dalai Lama 14th once when asked what books he would take if he were exiled to a desert island. The first book he mentioned was Hintwarash, um, not a Buddhist text. Then he mentioned the Dhammapada. Ambedkar is the first modern Buddhist scholar to pay attention to the structural and social dimensions of violence and suffering. Given his deep engagement both with Marxism and American pragmatism, remember Ambedkar was John Dewey's student, um, this isn't surprising. Marx led him to an understanding that the relevant social unit of analysis is class and social structure, not individual motivation or private attitude, and that the solution of any serious social problem must be structural, not psychological. Dewey taught him that true freedom is possible only in a democratic or egalitarian social structure. It's but a short step to seeing social stratification as the most significant locus of violence. Discussing the problem of caste in India, a lifelong preoccupation of this Dalit theorist who rose to the position of Minister of Justice, um, the most important issue with regard to which he and Gandhi parted company and the preoccupation that drove him to convert to Buddhism and to bring millions of other Dalits with him, here's what Ambedkar writes. And this is coming from The Dissolution of Caste. Again, a, a book that I think any educated person in the 21st century should have read. That the social order prevalent in India, and this is Ambedkar, is a matter which a socialist must deal with, that unless he does so, he cannot achieve his revolution, and that if he does achieve it as a result of good fortune, he will have to grapple with the social order if he wishes to achieve his ideal, is a proposition which, in my opinion, that is Ambedkar's opinion, is incontrovertible. As any pursuit of justice, Ambedkar realizes, and that is any release from the violence of injustice, 
requires attention to and reform of the social superstructures that constitute and reinforce that violence. He emphasizes that the problem with caste is not personal, and, there, and therefore it's not soluble by changing a bunch of individual attitudes rather than social structures, as Gandhi argued, right? That's what Gandhi thought. You work at the individual level, changing people's minds. Each person changes. Eventually this goes. Ambedkar said, that's crazy. You've got to start with structure. You've got to start with the superstructure that makes caste possible. Contemporary analyses of structural racism in the United States, I think, embody the same insight and come from the same wellspring. And because Ambedkar saw the problem of, oh, let me just, one little quotation from Ambedkar on this, I just have to read this. He says, the best of men cannot be moral if the basis of the relationship between them and their fellows is fundamentally the wrong relationship. To a slave, his master may be better or worse, but there cannot be a good master. I mean, that's really important. Because Ambedkar saw the problem of caste as structural and saw Buddhism with his explicit rejection, not only of caste, but of social rank and inequality to Kur as its solution, he argued that Buddha Dharma is directed at a critique of violent social structure and saw this as the core of Ahimsa. In the Buddha and his Dharma, he writes, it's a lovely passage from Ambedkar, the question that arises is, did the Buddha have a social message? Many people would say no, and for good reason. When pressed for an answer, students of Buddhism refer to two points. They say the Buddha taught ahimsa and the Buddha taught peace. Asked, did the Buddha give any other social message? Did the Buddha teach justice? Did the Buddhas teach love? Did the Buddhas teach liberty? Did the Buddha teach equality? Did the Buddhas teach fraternity? You can hear the modernism here. Could the Buddha answer Karl Marx? My answer, that is on Bedkar's answer, is that the Buddha has a social message and answers all of those questions. And of course, he argued the Buddha was a good Marxist avant la lettre. Uh, throughout this uh, remarkable text, excuse me, Ambedkar emphasizes an interpretation of Buddhist thought as social thought and of the Buddhist doctrine of Ahimsa, first and foremost as a call for revolutionary dismantling of violent social orders. Only when social orders have been revised, he argues, can meaningful individual transformation even take place. He thinks anything you do with individuals, it's just dust until you've actually cleaned things up. Ambedkar may have introduced the idea of socially engaged Buddhism, and it's his word, and the analysis of violence as structural, but Thich Nhat Hanh introduced the term structural violence to Buddhist thought. Structural violence, he emphasizes, is not constituted by the act of any specific individual, but by social, political, and economic structures that institute, constitute, and perpetuate large-scale harm. Institutions such as caste, racial discrimination, sexism, structural unemployment, and consumer capitalism, to name a few. To be sure, these structures are in part themselves constituted by individual actions, but they're not reducible to them. They often provide the context in which those actions have the meaning and significance that they do. Just as you can't give a piece of paper the significance of a dollar note without the Federal Reserve System, you can't give individual acts the significance of racism or sexism or oppression absent the context in which they occur. Um, but, uh, okay, so for instance, while a misogynist workplace might be constituted in part by the actions of individual managers and workers, it also makes it the case that what otherwise might be a friendly greeting, like, hey, you look great today, instead a case of sexual harassment. Um, these structures hence determine as well as reflect kinds of agency. They're kinds of agency you can't have in oppressive structures and kinds of agencies that you're almost forced to have in oppressive structures. And so the transformation of structure means the transformation of the possibilities of agency. To remediate the harm that a remark like that causes requires not simply the change of behavior of an individual, stop talking to your coworkers like that, but the change of the culture that gives that behavior its meaning and that perpetuates harms of that kind. Engaged Buddhist scholars like Thich Nhat Hanh, the Dalai Lama 14th, and Sulak Chivarak in Thailand, inspired not only by classical Buddhist social thought, such as that in Nagarjuna's Ratnavali, but also by Gandhi's analysis of that violence, of the violence of modernity in Hind Swaraj, have emphasized that the contemporary world is marked 
not only by pervasive acts of individual violence, but also by the structural violence that transcends, enables, and occludes the harm caused by those individual acts. And we shouldn't forget that. Structural violence doesn't only make this kind of individual violence possible, it also masks it and makes it look perfectly okay. Um, and that's just the way we do things. That's the way we talk around here. That's the custom around here. And that's just the kind of mystification and obfuscation that makes it hard to do, deal with structural violence. Thich Nhat Hanh is quite explicit about this application of Buddhist thought to a critique of violent social structures. Writing about the social dimensions of mindfulness, but reflecting broadly on aspects of the Eightfold Path, such as right speech, right livelihood, right action, and right thought, he says, oh, I'm just a little bit of Thich Nhat Hanh, just a tiny passage from uh, Interbeing. Aware that words can create suffering or happiness, we'll do our best to speak out speak out against situations of injustice, even when doing so may threaten our safety. Aware that great violence and injustice have been done to our environment and society, we're committed not to live with a vocation that's harmful to humans and nature. Aware of global economic, social, and political realities, we'll behave responsibly as consumers and as citizens, not supporting companies that deprive others of their chance to live. You can see the roots in Gandhi here. Um, we could keep going with this, but I'm going to move through. The through line from Ambedkar and Gandhi should be really clear. It should also be clear that Thich Nhat Hanh is tying the social program much more tightly to specific Buddhist doctrine. That is, this is a riff on the Eightfold Path. And it's clear that the violence he's identifying is structural violence, um, while the Ahimsa that he's advocating is active resistance to that structural violence. In response to the charge that is made, that this way of reading Buddhist doctrines is political and not religious, as though those two things are divorceable. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh says beautifully, teachers who say not to pay attention to the problems of the world, like hunger, war, oppression, and social injustice, who say that we should only practice, have not understood deeply enough the meaning of the Mahayana, the Mahayana Buddhist tradition. What is going on in the world is also going on in ourselves and vice versa. Once we see this clearly, we will not refuse to take a position or to act. Structural violence transcends particular acts because it causes harms that go well beyond those caused by any individual acts. Those structures continue to harm even when no individual is doing anything particularly harmful at the moment. Even when everyone's behaving appropriately, the knowledge that racial bias may inflect an interaction at any moment continues, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, poise, continues to poison interpersonal relations. Structural violence enables harms because it perpetuates the circumstances in which harmful acts are inevitable. Capitalism demands the existence of a reservoir of unemployed labor and the extraction of maximum value from every worker in order to enrich stockholders and executives. Structural violence occludes these harms because it normalizes the acts so that we cease to see them as harmful and even come to regard them as morally salutary. Hey, it's progress. Hey, it helps GDP per capita. Hey, it builds character. Hey, it keeps people from being dependent on welfare. Just go through all the lines you hear that explain to you why harms are really benefits. Um, so singing the praises of capitalism is the only route to prosperity as it poisons the planet and generates gaping inequality. To achieve nonviolence requires not only the transformation of our individual behavior, but the dismantling of these violent social structures. This is a big ask, of course, but as I noted at the outset, morality often asks a lot of us. The Dalai Lama 14th is really clear about this big ask. In Ethics for the New Millennium, he writes, our problems, both those we experience externally, such as wars, crime, and violence, and those we experience internally, our emotional and psychological suffering, cannot be solved until we address the underlying neglect of basic human needs. That's why the great movements of the last hundred years and more, democracy, liberalism, and socialism, have all failed to deliver the universal benefits they were supposed to provide. A revolution is called for, certainly but not a political or an economic or a technical revolution, but rather a spiritual revolution. The spiritual revolution the Dalai Lama recommends though is not internal or individual, but collective. It's not simply a revolution of attitude, but of the organizing principles of society. 
He sees the sources of the problems he identifies above in economic and social structures, and in particular in consumer capitalism, with its commitment to the creation of demand, the concentration of wealth, and to commodity fetishism, and in the inequality in income and power to which it leads and on which it, which it relies. His analysis throughout that remarkable book is structural, not psychological, and his critique of contemporary society is that the very systems that organize it are spiritually damaging and require revisioning. When one turn, I'm going to skip a long quotation, from, but you get the picture. When he turns to the analysis of nonviolence as it must manifest in the present century, Dalai Lama XIV is explicit in his view that this must be a global dismantling of the structures that constitute and promote violence. While he emphasizes that this action itself must be nonviolent, the commitment to nonviolence must also be a commitment to the eradication, not just non-participation, but to the eradication of the systemic pervasive violence that characterizes contemporary society. So now let's turn to that violence. Now let's actually talk about it. This gets a little political. <clears throat> we live in a world, and I'm not making any of this up, by the way. This is all just straightforward. And in a nation state, you might disagree with the implications, but the fact is there. Um, saturated with structural violence. The version of uncontrolled capitalism we collectively endorse through participating in it is violent through and through. Jeff Bezos earns over 6,000 times the median salary of his employees. 6,000 times the median salary of his employees. Unemployment tolerated as a means to suppress wages in order to maximize the shareholders of his corporation. Energy companies to spoil the environment contribute to climate change while corrupting politicians to gain support for their activities. Investment banks prey upon the vulnerable in order to generate astronomical profits for their wealthy partners and clients. The unjustifiable gap between the very rich and the middle class and the equally unjustifiable gap between the middle class and the world's poor is not being reduced. It continues to grow year by year. We tolerate famine, and we're tolerating it right now, while there is actually plenty in the world. We cause untold suffering to millions of animals and does the planet in factory farming in order to feed our population in a wildly inefficient manner. This is all happening, and it's all structural violence. Jackson versus Dobbs is structural violence. Cit oh, what is the beep? I'm not sure. Um, Citizens United is structural violence. Systematic racism in our economy, in our schools, in our policing, in our judicial system. Does anybody know what that sound is? Is structural violence. Maybe somebody objects to what I'm saying. I'm not sure. <laughs> is structural violence. Yeah, it, it may be that that, Dobbs v. Jackson thing triggered something at the university administration. I'm not sure. Um, okay. The pervasive uh, um, implicit uh, pervasiveness of implicit bias, not only among white people, but most tragically among black people in our culture, demonstrates the pervasive, corrosive power of this violence. The denial of access to health care to vast swaths of our population is structural violence. Denial of voting rights is structural violence. Educational inequality is structural violence. The United States taxation system that exempts the wealthy from paying their share while burdening the poor is structural violence. In each of these cases, we find social, political, or economic institutions that uncontroversially create massive harms to many for the benefit of a small class of the rich and powerful and cause widespread damage to our world for the benefit of a few who can insulate themselves from that damage. I mean, those are the facts. You can just do what you want with the moral assessment of it. Um, and we're all taught to accept this situation. Whatever you think about the desirability of these arrangements, the facts are beyond dispute. And once again, while there might be some actions on the part of identifiable individuals that are instrumental to this network of violence, the real damage is done by the structures constituted by these actions that in turn legitimize, enable, and encourage more of the same. This is what violence, or himsa, looks like in the contemporary world. And we cannot, in good conscience, turn away from it, for it's just as obviously wrong as it is normal. Now let's turn from politics to Buddhism, and in particular to the four ennobling truths. The first point to make is that the structural violence is dukkha, 
or suffering. That is the first of the noble truths. And it's dukkha in all three canonical senses of that term. So those of you who know your Buddhist philosophy know that, ah, I must have knocked something over, know that um, there are three senses of dukkha or suffering. There's evident everyday suffering. There's the suffering of change and the suffering of pervasive conditioning. Um, the routine pain, distress, and death caused by the ills of consumer capitalism and oligarchic rule of cause are too numerous and too obvious to need enumeration. But just to remind ourselves, they include poverty, illness, premature death, drug dependency, criminal lives, lives destroyed by criminals, despair, destruction of self-respect, and the list goes on and on. Right? That's all there. Second, the structural violence instantiates the suffering of change. It creates circumstances of uncertainty for those it harms, threatening further slides down the socioeconomic ladders, making any gain insecure and making it impossible to plan for the future. Time becomes an implacable enemy in such circumstances. And finally, and perhaps most obviously, it instantiates what's otherwise always the hardest kind of suffering to see, the suffering of pervasive condition. The systems of structural violence we've been discussing are totalizing. They define virtually every aspect of our lives and they're inescapable. Nearly everything we do from purchasing our food to seeking a job implicates us some way in the oppressive political structures, exploitative economic structures, or destructive structures of social domination. The fact that whether we support them or not, we're constantly implicated in them is the predicament referred to canonically as the suffering of pervasive condition. The fact of mo that most of what constitutes our lives is determined by forces outside of our control. We now turn to the second truth, that of the causes of dukkha. Um, again, to remind you, those are attraction and aversion grounded in primal confusion about the nature of reality. First, attraction. The frameworks we've been considering are both grounded in attraction and organized so as to generate and perpetuate that attraction. The Tibetan scholar Sogyo Rinpoche notes this fact when he compares capitalism to constantly offering a glass of salt water to a thirsty man. Um, advertising generates desire for products. The desire for wealth and power motivate corporate greed. The desire for power and prestige motivate social inequality. In each case, the harms we identified are not only caused by the relevant desire, they also serve to replicate. Just how much more wealth does Elon Musk actually need? How comfortable is the privileged white person when the demands of his black neighbor threaten his position of privilege? Which politician or manager do you know is satisfied that she now has enough power? Aversion is also constantly operative, the second of those, root, of, of those roots of suffering. The, um, the antipathies to one another along fault lines of religion, class, political views, nationality, race, and gender created um, by division and inequality and the fear of harm in which so many are forced to live help to fuel the very structures that elicit them. And for those who succeed, there's always the fear of loss of position, of falling back. And in the worst case, the fear that those at whose cost their success is achieved will rise up against them. Talking about a revolution may, as Tracy Chapman sings, sound like a whisper, but it's a whisper that never allows the rich and powerful to sleep well at night. Hence, their gated communities, private planes, and security apparatus. That stuff is not the stuff of happiness. And as the Buddha taught at Sarnat, attraction and aversion are grounded in a primal confusion. Canonically, that's called confusion about the fundamental nature of reality, including taking impermanent things to be permanent, the merely conventionally existent phenomena to be intrinsically real, taking interdependent phenomena to be independent, and taking what lacks a self to have a self, taking what's a source of suffering to be a source of happiness. We need to do very little to transpose these canonical descriptions of primal confusion to the present case. Systems of structural violence are maintained in part by the fact that those who participate in them take them to be part of the immutable nature of society. Proposals for change, especially for radical change, are simply dismissed as naive, as not understanding the nature of economics or politics. I expect that's how many of you will receive this, this talk. Permanence is taken for granted, that is, we're in an in fact impermanent situation. 
In the same vein, buttressed by social science and the interests of the powerful, these institutions are taken to be simply natural, not to be established by human conventions. Just the way the world is, intrinsically, not conventionally real. Structural violence often leads those of us who are its victims to see our own predicaments in isolation, to see the actions of others in isolation, and to ascribe autonomy and independence when there's in fact interdependence. These are just all transpositions of canonical Buddhist understandings of primal confusion. As Ambedkar saw, this is part of what Marx called false consciousness, and it's on false consciousness that, um, that consumer capitalism rests. When, when we agents who are in fact interdependent and bound up in structures that effectively determine our, their actions to be autonomous and independent actors, we obfuscate and hence perpetuate the structure of these violent systems. We find ourselves directing our efforts and directing our complaints against individuals and not against the systems that constitute their roles. This is one of the best achievements of false consciousness. You think the problem is that person's actions or that person's actions and not the, the system that enables them. And finally, all of these systems sell themselves to us as the only guarantors of such goods as political freedom, safety, and prosperity, and so forth, touting their values as sources of real happiness, when in fact they're mechanisms for the production of widespread suffering. The second of the four noble truths applies in this case as surely as the first. All of this comports with the Buddhist location of right view at the beginning of the Eightfold Path to Liberation. Since the entire mechanism of structural violence um, has its grounds in the attraction and aversion arising from fundamental confusion, the first step to undoing this massive suffering is understanding. Only if we see clearly how suffering arises from these complex social structures, and only if we see through the fog of false consciousness they induce, can we move effectively to undo them. This analysis is the gift of the engaged Buddhist movement, and it calls us to action. A call that in Buddhist terms is a call to the bodhisattva path to which we now turn. So we're now going to talk about what the bodhisattva path looks like in the 21st century. The path metaphor structures Buddhist ethical thought from the very beginning and in all Buddhist traditions. We begin with the Eightfold Path. We add the path of purification from Buddhaghosa. The bodhisattva path is outlined by Asanga, Vasubandhu, Chandrakirti and Shantideva, we get a lot of paths. Here I'm going to choose to follow the Bodhisattva path and the, um, explicating a contemporary Buddhist engagement with structural violence for several reasons. First, I think that Shantideva, um, who articulates the Bodhisattva path most beautifully, offers the most sophisticated exposition of Buddhist ethics in the canonical literature. That point's debatable. Some people prefer Buddhaghosa, but I think on the whole, Shantarakshita takes many of Buddhaghosa's insights and runs further down the field with them. Second, most of the principal theorists of engaged Buddhism work within the Mahayana tradition, and they rely on Shantideva's analysis. Third, Shantideva's analysis, more than any other, connects the moral phenomenology of Buddhist ethics to a program of action for the benefit of others. It's instructive that Shantideva's analysis of samsara um, begins with fear and its connection to vice and suffering. He argues in the first two chapters, think about that fear when I close this essay. Um, he argues in the first two chapters of Bodhicharya Vatara that most vice arise, arises from fear. And he suggests that the fear of death lies at the root of the primal confusion and self-grasping that conditions suffering. The Bodhisattva path is the path from fear to confidence, as well as a path to benefiting others. Once we focus on structural violence, we see that Shanti Deva's lesson applies here as well. So many of the oppressive systems that generate this kind of violence are maintained by pervasive fear. Fear of unemployment, fear of poverty, fear of lack of access to health care, fear of physical violence. A significant step in addressing structural violence is therefore forging the solidarity that allows us to step out of fear into confidence that we can make a difference. Let's now see how the cultivation of each of the six perfections on the Bodhisattva path addresses structural violence. Now we really are doing Buddhist doctrine and applying it. The first perfection on that path is the perfection of generosity, usually understood in the Mahayana tradition as threefold, comprising the giving of material support, of teaching, and of shelter from harm. At the individual level, the cultivation of generosity begins the process of decentering the self and self-interest and of developing a commitment to act for mutual benefit. 
Uh, Peter Kropotkin makes this point too beautifully in The Conquest of Bread, for those of you who like anarchist theory. Um, these are the attitudes necessary to become an agent for solidarity and for the dismantling of structural violence. At the systemic level, cultivating generosity entails revisioning institutions as mechanisms for promoting the general good rather than as devices for concentrating power and wealth, constraining the accumulation of obscene individual wealth, redistributing goods and services so as to alleviate poverty, suffering, and so forth. All goals which are directly achievable and which are blocked simply by taking greed and self-interest rather than generosity as our default motivations. The second perfection to be cultivated on the bodhisattva path is the union of recollection and introspective vigilance, often uh, translated as mindfulness. As, at this um, stage, we focus on recollecting and keeping in mind our values and commitments, and on mobilizing this to, mo to motivate action and to evaluate policy. It's one thing to endorse salutary moral principles and to aspire to personal and social transformation. It's another for those commitments to remain front and center in our consciousness and to derive our actions and attitudes. When we imagine social structures we endorse, those are structures that encourage these attitudes rather than those that celebrate egoism and competition and that encourage us to remain aware of our responsibilities, not to be distracted by bread and circus. The final perfections on the list are all individual in character, but instrumental in addressing structural violence. One of the most difficult and important qualities to cultivate on the next, on the path, the one I want to spend a little bit of time with you on is patience. Patience is posed on the bodhisattva path as an antidote to anger. And anger is often regarded in contemporary analyses as an appropriate response to injustice and to injury. A popular bumper sticker around where I live reads, if you're not angry, you're not paying attention. Um, and several influential contemporary philosophers valorize anger as the only appropriate way to show solidarity with the oppressed and to show self-respect. Um, Malika Cherry writes that anger has an important, as a quote, an important communicative function in an unjust world. It can remind us that the lives of the marginalized matter and it makes us aware that racial, in, that racial justice is lacking. It also motivates productive action towards creating a more just world. Um, here, Cherry notes three important potential benefits from anger. One, it communicates our disapproval of injustice and solidarity with those who suffer. <laughs> Two, it reminds us of our commitment to social justice and of just how urgent that commitment is. And three, it motivates us to act on our commitments and to supplement our words and thoughts with action. The astute reader of Buddhist ethics will recognize both that these are three genuinely valuable consequences of anger and that each is a version of one of the perfections identified by Chandrakirti and Shantideva on the Bodhisattva path. The first expresses generosity in the form of the extension of protection. The second expresses attention, that's smarty, sometimes translated as mindfulness, calling to mind our commitments and values. And the third, commitment, virya. And Cherry notes correctly that emotions, including positive emotions, such as love and compassion, as well as negative emotions, such as anger, have not only an affective, but also a political dimension, both because they can be directed towards state to their actions and because they can motivate political action. Shantideva, though, famously disagrees with her perspective, and so do I, with all deep respect. Anger is always regarded as a psychopathology in the Buddhist moral psychology, the Sanskritist klesha. There are good reasons for this. One, anger clouds our judgment, making us less effective agents and collaborators. It causes harm to ourselves and others, and, and it reflects a distorted view of agency. The latter is particularly apposite in the context of structural violence. Anger typically directs our moral attention to individuals, not to institutions. When we do that, we attribute um, a original intent, a agent causation to the targets of our anger. And this distracts us from the role of institutions and structures in constituting the, that violence and in framing the actions to which we respond. And this reduces our own effectiveness as agents. So while anger may reflect the benefits that Cherry identifies, I think the costs are too high, epistemically, practically, and morally. Now, Cherry anticipates my argument, characterizing what she calls Lordian rage as a type of anger that is inclusive rather than exclusive, that aims at liberation, that's transformative and motivated by compassion. 
because it's so motivated and because it can be precisely targeted against practices and institutions, as opposed to individuals, she argues that it can be virtuous. And she argues that such rage is fitting and appropriate, her words, in the context of social evils such as racism and inequality, because these are the kinds of harms at which one ought to be angry, as anger is the appropriate response to harm. But I think these responses are beside the point. The fact that anger may be sufficient to motivate action aimed at liberation that it might be motivated by compassion and a sense of justice, even together with the premise that anger is understandable and appropriate in the context of harm, neither entail that it's necessary to motivate action on behalf of justice or to demonstrate solidarity with and respect for the victims of injustice. The dispassionate but caring recognition of injustice and its wrongs, the cool commitment to right those wrongs, and the recognition of human commonality can achieve all of that and can do so without the destructive side effects of even appropriate or fitting anger. Amphetamines might be sufficient to wake me up in the morning, but a cup of coffee is certainly preferable. The same is true, mutatis mutandis, for the preferability of righteous indignation, um, as Dr. King put it, over anger. And effectiveness is important. This is why the cultivation of patience um, hence, is hence necessary if we're to be effective Buddhist revolutionaries. Now, um, the fourth perfection is commitment, the fifth perfection um, of meditation, and these are really important to develop the energy and the calm and clarity to, uh, to work uh, in engaged Buddhism. Um, and the final perfection on the Bodhisattva path is the perfection of wisdom or insight. No political action against structural violence, no matter how well motivated, can be effective without insight into the systems that perpetuate it, into the motivations of those who perpetuate it and who are victimized by it, and into one's own psychology as an actor. Just as primal confusion is the root of all suffering, including this pervasive system of social suffering, the insight that eliminates that confusion is essential to extirpate that root. So much for the Bodhisattva path. We're now going to talk about moral transformation for nonviolence, and we're going to return to the Theravada tradition and to Buddha Gosa. So we're moving around in the Buddhist tradition backwards from engaged Buddhism to the Mahayana to the Theravada. Uh, the Bodhisattva path hence provides a roadmap for a radical program of personal and social transformation. And Shantideva um, is an ally for contemporary engaged Buddhism. But if we're looking for an account of the moral psychology of the engaged Buddhist agent, we could do no better than to turn to Buddha Gosa's account of the Brahma Viharas as a sketch of that desideratum. When we do so, once again, we can allow ourselves to read these states both individually and institutionally. My tree, or friendliness, is the first of these four states. By pursuing the engaged bodhisattva path, we make ourselves good friends to others allies in the struggle against structural violence, rather than people who are unwillingly complicit in it. But we're also called upon to develop new social structures that are themselves friendly to and encourage friendship and solidarity among our fellow citizens. That is, we can understand our social goals as well as our personal development in terms of Maitri. Instead of institutions that create division, inequality and insecurity and widespread poverty, we can develop social arrangements aimed at the general good. Karuna, or care, sometimes translated compassion in one of the worst translations in Buddhist uh, philosophical English. Uh, karuna, or care, allows us to see the suffering of others as itself a motivation for action, displacing our own suffering as the only motivator for the relief of pain. This state of character, like my tree, <clears throat> reflects a decentering of ourselves in the moral universe and the perception of an isotropic moral landscape in which everyone's happiness and suffering counts and serves as motivating. But it's also like my tree, an institutional goal. The social change that engaged Buddhism demands must construct an economic health and political system that cares for, that's karuna, all individuals and does not allow many to suffer so that a few billionaires can prosper. Anarcho-syndicalist, Marxist, the Occupy movement have all seen this necessity as well. But engaged Buddhism gives us the theoretical grounding for this revolutionary goal. And this theorization was central to Ambedkar's work on behalf of Dalits in India. Mudita, or sympathetic joy, complements these two. 
It constitutes an affective and perceptual set in which the success of others is a cause for rejoicing. It stands against egocentricity. It encourages the development of institutions that facilitate the, the success of all. And the final Brahma Vihara, Upeksha or impartiality, contrasts um, not only with selfishness, but with clannish or jingoistic partiality. It seeks to undermine the centering of competition in a capitalist economy, of partisanship in politics, partiality in the distribution of goods. And once again, it has both an inst individual and an institutional face. Individually, we're called upon to cultivate this impartiality that ensures that our engaged action is undertaken on behalf of all. Institutionally, we're called upon to replace violent structures that benefit some, but not others, with those aimed impartially at the benefit of all. Together, the Brahma Viharas traditionally conceived enable a moral vision in which we come to inhabit a centerless domain of interconnected agents. This experience is opposed to one in which we inhabit the center pole, in which we take our own narrow self-interest to be at least prima facie motivating and justificatory of our actions, and in which the degree to which others and their interests matter is directly proportional to their proximity on some relevant dimension to us. That's a vision, unfortunately central to contemporary economic theory and to much political theory grounded on it, that's difficult to endorse reflect, that is as difficult to endorse reflectively as it is natural to occupy. I mean, almost all of us occupy that naturally. We care most about the people close to us. And then when you ask, why should that be? It's really hard to say in a way that you can look yourself in the mirror while you say that. The goal of Buddhist moral cultivation is the spontaneous occupancy of that vision that vision of an impartial um, moral universe, bringing our experience in line with our reflective understanding of our legitimate place as individuals among multitudes, sharing in rather than running the world, um, as well as an understanding of interdependence with others. This analysis through the lens of engaged Buddhism shows us that the Brahma Viharas have a social face as well. Just as we individually abandon the center pole, for a homogenous landscape that facilitates responsiveness to others, we're called upon to rebuild our social institutions in a way that constructs just to such a landscape, one in which there is no center to which all benefits flow in the midst of a vast periphery that's thereby disadvantaged. We can conceive of that future and we can see its desirability, just as we can conceive of our own future moral maturity and see its desirability. This also suggests a broadening of our sense of social justice. We've got to think of social justice, not simply in terms of the extension of equal rights to all, not simply in terms of a more equitable distribution of resources, though to be sure, these are important constituents of any true social justice. But instead, we should think of social justice in terms of the teleology of our social institutions. We can think of them not as vehicles for the more efficient exploitation of resources, not as vehicles for profit maximization or wealth concentration, not as means to defend some against the predation of others, but rather as dedicated to collective welfare, to the alleviation of suffering per se, and to the facilitation of moral community among persons. There is no real conflict between a modern commitment to human rights and to social justice on the one hand, and to an ethics and politics grounded in these Brahma Viharas on the other. On the contrary, as Ambedkar and the Dalai Lama have each seen clearly, Human rights and the pursuit of justice are an upaya, a skillful means that we can use in our rhetoric and in our action to realize these values of friendship, of care, of impartiality, of sympathetic joy in our political institutions and in the modern means through which we can dismantle and replace structural violence that conditions our collective life at present. And I wanna conclude with a few final thoughts. I am conscious of the fact that all of this will sound like the ravings of an idealist hippie from the 60s. And perhaps that's what it is, because here I am, an idealistic hippie from the 60s. I may never have outgrown that sensibility. But the fact that it's idealistic raving doesn't mean that it's wrong. Um, it is morally and politically radical. But Siddhartha Gautama, the historical Buddha, and the prototype idealistic hippie was radical. And the metaphysical and ethical program he inaugurated was radical. Buddhism continues to be radical today. And the engaged Buddhist movement reflects that radicalism. We can tame Buddhism. 
We can pretend that it's politically neutral, that it's a renunciant tradition with nothing to say about the real world. But that would be to deny both its clear ethical implications and the history of Buddhist philosophy itself. The Buddha's institution of a large shramanic order was socially radical, as was his rejection of caste, as was his decision to ordain women. The political philosophy articulated by Nagarjuna, second century Buddhist philosopher, in the jeweled garden, Garland Ratnavali, encouraging a vast social welfare apparatus in his Indian kingdom, including not only universally free barbers and health care. This was really good. This was health care with barbershop visits covered. And it's right there in the Ratnavali, right? Um, not making this up, but also the regular feeding of ants. Um, this was all radical. And the present Dalai Lama and Thich Nhat Hanh each remind us that if we really bring our Buddhist moral principles into our lives, and especially into our collective political lives, those principles demand radical change. To tame Buddhism, to relegate it to the temple or the monastery, is to betray it. The only serious Buddhism is radical Buddhism, and radical Buddhism is demanding. All of this reminds me, old hippie that I am, of an American philosopher of the 1960s. Jane Fonda famously said, revolution is an act of love. We might transpose that statement. The cultivation of my tree, often translated as love, is a revolutionary act. And so I'm gonna conclude as I began with the minstrels of engaged Buddhism, the indigo girls. In the kind words you speak and in the turn of the cheek, when your vision stays clear in the face of your fear, then you see turning out a light switch is their only power when we stand like spotlights in a mighty tower. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Garfield, for that riveting lecture. We have about 15 minutes left for the question and answer session. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand and a microphone will be passed to you. So uh, I will take on the first, first person I saw raise their hand. Hello. Yeah. Um, Thanks for a very enlightening talk. Uh, it was truly inspiring. Um, you drew from a variety of sources, referred to many people, Gandhi, Ambedkar, Marx, uh, uh, some of the Buddhist scholars. Now, I, I think you also focused on, on structural violence and I, I was wondering that I think it's fair to say that um, Buddha and most Buddhists talk about um, you know the Eightfold Path, which directly um, tries to address oneself. Yes. Um, Gandhi's preoccupation with um, with um, not only uh, ahimsa but also uh, Swaraj is, although he mentions things like, you know, freedom from uh, foreign rule, free, but also freedom from um, rich capitalism yeah. within, in fact, freedom from civiliz civilization, so called, yeah. but primarily focusing on uh, freedom from one's, oneself. Yes. Uh, so I was just wondering that. I think for many people, freedom from oneself is a very difficult thing to, to achieve. Yes. Uh, and you can think, I think of myself, uh, and I know that even though I try, it's, it's not so easy. Mm -hmm. But at least we can try. Yes. However, how is a person also going to, I'll use the word attack, but you know, not in an angry way, to, to change structures? Um, what what can we do as yeah. people? Because you know you, structures have their own um, logic, I suppose, but also they are held in place by our power, and power is often uh, at the individual level as well as structural power. So my question for this long-winded introduction is: is own freedom is difficult, yeah. but at least we know how to, some ideas of how to do it, but how do you change uh, structural injustice and structural mm. violence? Thank you. That's a wonderful question. And I'm glad that you brought 
uh, Gandhiji into this. And I'm also glad that you brought the emphasis on Swaraj into this. Um, because of course, you're absolutely right. And as I noticed, as I noted, most people who start thinking about Buddhism think of this as a shramanic tradition of withdrawal from the world. One person is a very noted monk I talked to when I was told him I was working on engaged Buddhism said, I thought Buddhism was about disengagement. Um, and there is a reading like that. But I also want to emphasize that just as Gandhi emphasized properly that Swaraj, as he understood it, was two-faced. As you pointed out, it was individual self-mastery and social Swaraj, that is independence, political independence. <clears throat> I think that Buddhist ethical thought is similarly doubly faced. And I think that's the, the value of the engaged Buddhist movement. And this isn't, I mean, people say, oh, this is new and modernist. It's right there in Nagarjuna, right? Second century. If you read about Navali, it's all there. Um, but think about Gandhiji. He had two problems, right? One was individual Swaraj and experiments with truth really talks hard about that. But he also had an independence movement to run. And when the movement for Indian independence began, Nobody thought the British Empire could be dislodged, let alone dislodged by uh, a lawyer and a loincloth, right? Lawyer and a doti. Nobody thought that. And as Gandhi said so beautifully at one point, when you start to fight, first they ignore you, then they dismiss you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. Um, and I think that looking at the example of the independent struggle as conducted by the Indian National Congress. And I'm not just thinking about Gandhi, but I'm thinking of other heroes of that, including Ambedkar, um, but also including Lala Lajpat Rai and people like that. Um, what we see is a, an example that can be right in front of all of us, um, as it was right in front of Dr. King, for instance, in another nonviolent struggle, where we see that those who adopted violence against a violent oppression failed pretty miserably. Those who adopted an ahimsa approach succeeded dramatically. Um, and I think that we need to pay more attention to those successes than we do. And the last thing I'll say is, if you pay attention to Gandhi's writings on Swaraj, both in Hind Swaraj and in Experiments with Truth in particular, you see that Gandhi didn't argue that first we need individual Swaraj, then we can look at collective Swaraj. Nor did he argue that first we need collective Swaraj, then we can have individual Swaraj. He argued that those two have to be, have to be joined. And um, that means that individual cultivation demands social action, just as social action demands individual cultivation. Now, none of this is to say, oh, and here's the easy five-step program to doing it. You're right, both are hard but I don't think one of them is necessarily harder than the other. I believe there was a question here. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I also kind of want to follow up with uh, on Amitabha's question is that a lot of the examples that you mentioned for structural violence tend to be on the economic side. Mm -hmm. And so, how and then I can understand what you, your answer to Amitabha, but maybe if we can ask this question uh, by situating, for example, what would you tell Tibetans against the structural violence of PLA occupation mm -hmm. when there are snipers on route? rooftops and then you know uh, a PLA a station every street corner and with you know every scan and everything so. What do you think that you, what would you tell them? And then, um, and on the other side, what about those, you know, Buddhist rulers in Sri Lanka, uh, Buddhist rulers in um, uh, Myanmar? Yeah, Myanmar. And then, or, or the idea that, you know, the possessions are not uh, impermanent. It's interesting that so the uh, Japanese suicidal uh, 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 bombers in the time in, in the Second World War, they were taught exactly this. Don't worry about dying, dying for the emperor, because, you know, ultimately we all go back to dust. And then just one last question, question, sorry. What if India 
were a you know were a Buddhist country rather than a Buddhist a Hindu country. <laughs> That's quite a number of questions. Um, let me try to take them um, in order, and to begin with the Tibetan situation. Um, I would agree entirely with uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama on this, that the idea that the way Tibet will regain um, its independence is through armed violent resistance against the People's Liberation Army is a joke. Um, just as we could have said the idea that India could have achieved independence through armed insurrection against the occupying army of, of the United Kingdom would have been a joke. Um, so violence might often look like a justifiable or an understandable path. That is, I can understand why a Tibetan reacts with violence, but that doesn't mean it's the right way to react. And this gets at my disagreement with Cherry on, on violence. I can understand that it's often makes, we can often understand a violent reaction, but that doesn't mean that it's an effective reaction. Um, and that even though nonviolent struggle, which even might mean long-term struggle in exile, um, might be slow and take generations, it has a chance to succeed. Um, uh, whereas violent struggle, only delegitimizes the people who struggle and uh, fails and provokes more violent repression. And especially if you're looking at a, um, a conflict with a power who is quite willing to use absolutely unlimited violence against you, as is, as is unfortunately the case in the PRC. Um, the second question was, what do I say about the uh, the Buddhist regimes in Sri Lanka and Myanmar. And I just have to say that, you know, Buddhists, just like everybody else, are capable of um, behavior that belies their own um, explicit commitments. Um, you know, lots of Lutherans and Catholics uh, produced the Holocaust for us. Lots of people who subscribe to Russian Orthodoxy are creating massive amounts of violence right now. Every one of these religious traditions eschews violence. Um, that doesn't mean that the people who claim to subscribe to them are actually acting harmoniously. I, I think that something people forget that the Dalai Lama once said, and I think he repeats this in Ethics for a New Millennium, but in an interview he said, I have to say that if you look at human history, on the whole, religion has been really a bad idea and that it's caused far more harm than good and that we would have been better without any religion, including Buddhism. And he said, you know, I don't have much choice given my job, but to <laughs> work in this religion. But he said, honestly, if you look at it, religion has been has motivated um, sectarian harm more than it's motivated nonviolence. All I'm trying to do is argue that if we're if you're seriously committed to Buddhist ethical outlook, that it's got a social face and it's got a social face that offers us an analysis of structural violence that's informative. Um, and a kind of approach to thinking about reduction of violence that actually makes more sense than some others. Not, the, not necessarily the best, but we can make sense of it. The last question you asked, uh-oh, uh-oh, this is my memory going. Oh, what if India, I, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I mean, in, look, India's own internal um, Joy's complexity, craziness, and, and beauty probably transcend any specific religious identity. I mean, India has gone through so many uh, periods of history and religious affiliation that it, it manages to survive almost any ideology in its own wonderful way. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I think that's hard to say. I think there was a question up front. First, thanks for the wonderful talk. I almost, you know, agree with every word you talk about the, you know, structural uh, violence. Actually, before I come to this talk, I just uh, look at the website of the fellowship offered by Asian Study Organization. Mm -hmm. They will pay professors about two thousand five hundred for one month salary. They would require professors to work about one hundred sixty hours a month to receive that money but on the other hand you know i think you know actually this kind of structural 
violence, you know, with this kind of capitalism was clearly identified by Chinese government. So they, they said, you guys are too greedy capitalist. You should, you know, give up your, you know, personal properties and make sure the whole society, everybody in the society should march into the prosperity altogether. So that kind of slogan, I don't know how you would like to comment on. Those slogan, not only is, you know, a policy going to be implemented, actually it was implemented in the 1950s, 1960s. All the capitalists have to give up their, you know, properties, but in the name of the, you know, well-being of the whole society. That's one thing. Also the Buddhist, you know, ethical doctrines. I think as an individual, I have the aspiration to use those doctrines to require myself. It's beautiful. But how about the government? If the government adopted those idealized standards and imposed on people, what kind of disaster is going to happen? I ask this because it's during Cultural Revolution, mm -hmm. professors like us actually mm -hmm. were criticized, which enjoyed comfortable life. Like we, you know, really comfortable yeah. in this condition, conditioning air uh, space, we should go to outside to work with the peasants, mm -hmm. with the, you know, blue collar workers. Yeah. We should give up our housings and should give, you know, the opportunity of education to the working class instead of our own children. It was implemented. So in the discourse of idealism. So I'm wondering how you would comment on it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's that's a, a powerful and difficult challenge to all to all of us. Um, so, um, there's, there's two parts to the question that I'd like to address, and I'd like to address them independently. The first one is what to say about the so-called great proletarian cultural revolution, um, and to think about that historically and what, and, and, and how that, uh, how that disaster unfolds. Um, and the second is to is, the, is what came up at the end of your remark, which is what would it be for a government to impose this vision? And I think those are two slightly different questions and I want to treat them differently. Um, the first, uh, regarding the proletarian cultural revolution. Um, here's the one thing I'm gonna say that might be unpopular. Some of the motivation of the cultural revolution, some of it was actually on target. That is that um, massive economic inequality um, in China was not a good thing and was not conducing to, um, to general prosperity. That's a pretty tiny piece of it. Um, all of the implementation, plus the idea that somehow that the problem was um, an intellectual class, um, the problem was classical Chinese thought and so forth. Um, and that organizing mass violence through the Red Guards was the best way to achieve that was absolutely lunatic, right? Um, so, and the idea that somehow state violence was preferable to uh, economic structural violence was also crazy. So we can look at, you know, this, this veneer of, hey, um, massive inequality is not working for us and say, yeah, but that doesn't justify anything that's in that, that is mobilized to undo it. It justifies skillful ways to do that and nonviolent ways to do that. And I think the great proletarian cultural revolution was nothing like that, right? I mean, it was, it was utterly insane. And it wasn't necessarily the dismantling of capitalism that was the problem. It was the dismantling of the entire um, system of um, agriculture, production of distribution of education and the unleashing of kind of wanton class violence um, that, that was problematic. Um, that might make me sound like a Mao apologist. I hope it doesn't um, because I'm not, <laughs> um, but it, it just means to say that the problem with the great proletarian cultural revolution was not the desire to eliminate inequality. Um, it was everything else that went into that. Um, then I want to make it clear that what when I talk about adopt, working for social structures, political structures, and economic structures that um, are less structurally violent, what I'm not talking about 
is autocracies that decree and demand particular kinds of attitudes or structures. Rather, what I'm, 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 I'm defending is a collective examination and developing of insight into and reworking of structures into ways that make them less violent. For instance, um, a good hard examination of the US taxation system is overdue. Um, we have a taxation system that is so bizarrely regressive that nobody in their right mind could justify it. We have a system for the preservation for the delivery of health care that is so bizarre um, and so expensive and so inefficient and so inequitable that no rational person can justify it. We have a system for funding education that perpetuates, we, you know, it used to be that we thought about education as the way to generate social mobility. And there was a time when it was, but now education, our education system is one of the most powerful vehicles for, in, for decreasing social mobility that we have. That we all recognize that as wrong. And we can work collectively to develop social structures that don't do that. We have systems, a system of voting that makes sure that voting is not a universal franchise. My other country is one that requires everybody to vote and makes it easy for everybody to vote. Um, I would much rather be voting in Australia than voting in the United States in any election, because I'd rather know that everybody is voting than that a large number of people are systematically disenfranchised. Um, I could go on and on. None of this is talking about establishing a proletarian dictatorship mandating particular policies. What we're talking about is actively advocating for rational, humanistic, social and political structures and recognizing that the ones that we've got masquerade as inevitable and benevolent and are anything but. And that part of what they meant, you know, little lesson in Sanskrit. <laughs> um, the term that I want to focus on is samvurti, as in samvurti satya, conventional truth. It's the best philosophical term in history because it's ambiguous in the following way. One meaning is conventional, ordinary, every day. The other meaning is occluding, covering up, and obscuring. And when we look at the conventions that we have in our society, the everyday practices we have, they are designed to systematically cover up and occlude the structures they create and the effects of those structures and to make them look just like the inevitable way of the world. And that's what Marx called false consciousness. Um, and that's the kind of primal confusion that makes it possible for each of us to behave in ways in which we are unwittingly but culpably complicit in massive structural violence. We can say that without endorsing anything like Maoism. That's what I think. Yeah. Well, on that resounding note, we are out of time. Oh. Uh, I think Michelle Hux has a few words to say. Just to to um, before I thank our speaker again, just to thank you all for coming. To say there will be opportunities to continue the conversation outside, where there will be food and drink uh, as well. Um, but first and foremost, please uh, give a. Huge hand to both of them. <laughs>